You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach. Welcome to my podcast. What? You have a podcast? What? You don't have a podcast? Does everyone? Does no one? There are a lot of them. I'm glad that you've decided to listen to mine. Every week, I talk about the five things that make my life better because this is a crazy time. A lot of people I know are having weird dreams, very detailed, very creepy dreams of the version that I get all the time, but now a lot of people I know are having them. I had a dream once about Russia taking over the United States and announcing, you are ours now, O-U-R-S. I swear, that was my dream. Anyway, it's a weird time, but it's a beautiful fall week, and I do this podcast to actually remind myself and to remind you that there's still things. They may be minor. They may be enormous. They may be theoretical. They may be actual that make our lives better. And we need to keep those in our minds so that we don't get, I don't know, so we don't tilt, as they say in the pinball world. Yeah, that's exactly why I do this. So I'm going to do mine. Our guest today, Lisa Tadeo, the author of Three Women, will do hers, and maybe you'll do yours at home. Or, you know, I don't care where you do it, but come up with five. It might make your day better. Okay, number one is public art. Now, cities love to... Actually, I'm going to say cities don't do enough of it. I changed gears. That's okay. Okay. Cities don't do enough of it. New York, in my opinion, doesn't do enough of it. There might be a statue in front of a building, and that is public art, but that's not enough. And it's exciting when things change, and it's exciting when public art gets in your way, gets in your face, so that you have to confront it and you get to enjoy it. One of my favorite pieces was in Columbus Circle a few years ago. There, It's named after Christopher Columbus, And an organization, public arts organization, erected a living room around the top of the statue as if Christopher Columbus lived in a very ordinary, well, very good location, so it would have been very expensive, but a very ordinary apartment in New York. And you had to take stairs up or an elevator to see it. That was cool. It created an environment. Christopher Columbus was standing in the middle of it, but there was a TV, there were coffee table books. You could just sort of come and hang with him. Right now, I want to cite the Alex Katz cutouts that are planted in the middle of Park Avenue in Midtown. Alex Katz, if you've been following along, is one of my favorite artists. Still living, still producing, still very much vital. These are several, I don't know how many, cutouts of a woman. You see her from the back. She's taller than we are. Very simple, very flat, repetitive, and somehow just joyful as if, oh, look, in the median, there's a person wearing a scarf and a coat. She looks like someone I know. It's just food for thought, people. Just food for thought. But I like it. And I'm appreciative of it. Park Avenue medians usually get something cool. The vessel in Hudson Yards is now the sort of latest public art thing space. I am probably the only one I know who has not been on it. And I'm not a big fan of Hudson Yards, so I'm a fuddy-duddy. Number two, eye drops. Okay, if you're like me, You have questionable posture and dry eyes as a result of hunching over your laptop. Now, I have what my physical therapist would call really bad sedentary hygiene. I think that just means I don't sit right. And I should really be standing at my desk. I should really have an elevated desk. I should really not be using a laptop at my desk. I should use a desktop at my desk. I should do a lot of things differently. I shouldn't have had two slices of rye bread. But I love eye drops because staring at a computer screen actually dries one's eyes out. And I use a special eye drop for contact lens people. It's not, you know, a prescription. It's just a drop. 
And every time I put them in my eyes, I think, oh, my God, I love this. Why didn't I do this an hour ago? Every single time. But anyway, some eye drops is better than no eye drops. Number three, I'm going to call this one the humility of being rejected. A few months ago, I applied for a teaching position. Nobody knows this. This was not a public thing for a winter term at a selective college in New England, a college that I might have applied to, let's say, when I was applying to college, a college that might rhyme with Giddle Ferry. I don't know what the college is called, but I applied, I wrote out an outline to Giddleberry for a nonfiction writing class that I wanted to teach during Giddleberry's January term. And get this, I was waitlisted. I was waitlisted. That is even worse than being rejected. That's like, eh, we think we have it covered. We don't really, we do, we're not that excited about you, but hold next January in case we have a change of schedule. Okay, it hurt. I have to say it hurt. I thought the proposal was good. I shared it with another person who actually teaches at Giddle Gary, and she thought it was really good, and I got over it. I just got a new email from this institution telling me that the wait list has now turned into a full rejection because they, they have They filled all their spots. So it took me about three months to get over the little bruise. And also, P.S., I really wanted to do it. I really wanted to see if I could teach. I didn't want to risk anybody for too long. I thought a month, how much damage could I do in a month? I thought it'd be a good experience for them and me. I'm not really a snow person, so I thought that would mean when I wasn't teaching and grading my students' papers, I would be writing in my rented room. I'd be really all about the work. So they just wrote me another letter. No, this time it was an email. Maybe I'll get a hard copy telling me that they don't want me, but that I could, of course, apply for next year. I don't think so. So why is this a good thing, you ask? The more I talk about it, the more I think it isn't a good thing. But I think the humility is good. Sometimes I get a big head. God knows I've had a lot of rejection. Even post-success, I've had a lot of rejection in my career, just a really a lot. But I hadn't been waitlisted in a long time. And it's something that I can talk about and laugh at, but I'm dis- look, I'm disappointed, but it gives me a goal. The goal is not to reapply there. But, you know, once you're deprived of something, it sort of helps you focus. And now I think, yeah, damn it, I think I could be a good teacher. But there's only one way to know, and that's by trying it. So I'm going to have to find another place to apply to, maybe with lower standards. (laughs) Number four, (coughs) cooking no longer scares me. Now, I know I've talked about food and cooking and stuff a bit, but you have to understand, I never cooked until I would say the last 12 or so years. And even so, with such fear and stress, and uh, did I get the measurements right? And why is there so much salt in my banana bread? And you're not supposed to eat the bay leaf? I don't know, just stuff. I was always a nervous cook. But now it's seven o'clock. I haven't made plans. I'm not looking at any menus. I'm not going to seamless. I head to my refrigerator, my freezer, and I cook dinner. You don't know how shocking it is. The most valuable drawer I had at home for years was my menu drawer. Sorry, exhibits. And now I can look at a raw chicken and say, "Uh, you're mine. I know what to do with you, and I got you. So... This is a good feeling, and I'm grateful for it. Number five, 
We're getting to number five. I'm just going to have a little narrative to number five. I attended a friend's birthday lunch last weekend, and it was all women. And I looked around the table, and one of the people there I've known for really like 40 years, and some I just met. And I'm looking around the table, and everybody has reading glasses, and some people have gray hair, and some people don't, and some people have wrinkles, and some people don't. And you know what? I thought, damn it, we're here. No one's going to take pleasure away from us. Let's celebrate birthdays. Let's celebrate what we have. Let's celebrate friendship. Don't let the bastards get you down. We've got to fight all the way to the finish. So it was, how do I distill that into number five? No bastards. Number five is no bastards. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, coming up, we have the writer Lisa Tadeo. Her book, Three Women, has become something of a publishing sensation. I read it breathlessly. You will too. Don't go away. I am really thrilled. Thrilled plus really is even more than really thrilled to have Lisa Tadeo in the studio. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Yes, you are. Might have been smart to ask you before. (laughs) Uh, Lisa, if you haven't heard, is the author of Three Women, a nonfiction account of three women, three American women, a very deep dive into their lives as it relates to desire and their innermost private thoughts and deeds. It is. It reads like a novel uh, or a three-part novel, and yet it's all, it's all real. And Lisa, welcome, welcome. I feel like even though the book was published in July, you've been on the road like crazy. Isn't that right? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm totally honored. Um, yes, it's been kind of, uh, it's been a little bit of a wild ride. And on top of the wild ride, because of the great reception and acclaim, how long were you working on this book and embedded in lives of other people? So I began work on the book a little over eight years ago. Um, I crisscrossed the country six times total. I Once I found my subject, which was probably definitely the hardest part of the project, I spent about two years either living amongst them and moving to their towns or and or talking on the phone extensively, emailing, um, FaceTiming, et cetera. Was what was the pitch to your editor at Simon and Schuster? So it he actually somewhat pitched me. Um, I was younger, <laughs> clearly, because it's been over a decade. Um, and I was writing articles for Esquire and New York Magazine. And I had written a story called The Half Hooker Economy, which is reductive as <laughs> magazine articles, I mean, as headlines <laughs> tend to be. Um, but I had, it was, it started out being a story about Tiger Woods and his alleged affair with Rachel Yucatel. So I went to go talk to her in. Las Vegas, and she was um, like an ambassador to the world of bottle girls, which she had been embroiled in. Well, wait, was that her <laughs> official job title? So she was. She used to be a bottle girl, right? Um, what she was then was a um, concierge. I forget the actual title, but bottle she was concierge. Yes, yeah, she and was curator. Exactly. She was kind of the. Well, it, sometimes she was called the general manager of the club, but what her real job was to be a concierge of the experience, and. While I was talking to her, I went to a lot of clubs I in L.A. and Las Vegas and New York, and I was like the only person sober at 2 a.m. in Tenjun and One Oak, uh, etc. And while I was there, while I wanted to understand Rachel Yucatel's lifestyle, I also became so fascinated with the bottle girls themselves, these women who were essentially, they weren't prostitutes, but They were quite willingly um, going on trips with men that they were serving at the tables. These $10,000 tables where you're in a back room of a club and you're getting Jeroboam's of vodka and and drinking Cristal, etc. And these young women are bringing it to you. And then 
the men would say, let's go to Miami this weekend. And the young wo- woman would say, okay, great. And there would be perhaps a Manolo Blahnik shoe coming in, in sort of exchange. And it didn't even mean that they were having sex necessarily. It was somewhat a girlfriend experience, having a lovely girl in your arm. It was also having a yacht that's just filled with beautiful women. And my editor, Jofi Ferrari Adler, who is now the head of Avid Reader Press, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster, he uh, asked me if I would like to write a book. And because I was writing articles for Esquire in New York, but I had mostly, I thought he wanted, I was like, oh, I have this novel that I've been writing for. (laughs) And he said, no, you know, I'd be more interested in you doing a book of nonfiction. Um, So he said, you know, it can be anything you want, basically. And I was, that was terrifying. That's a good offer. It was great, but it was terrifying because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And the the topics were, you know, (laughs) the wide range of what one could write. I was like, should I do something in Antarctica? Should I? I was younger and and less afraid than I am now. I'm utterly, completely afraid of everything now. Uh, So I he sent me a number of books uh, among them, like Joan Didion and Janet Malcolm and Tracy Kidder and Tom Wolfe, these sort of new the new journalists. So it was like a a cram course. Yes. Well, I had already read. I was already interested in Joan Didion and Tracy Kidder. Sure. But the one that I wasn't didn't really know about was Gay Talese's Thy Neighbor's Wife. Right. Are you familiar with it? Yes, I am. But we should say to the listeners who aren't. This is a book of nonfiction in which Gay Talese also, you should excuse the expression, embedded himself (laughs) in the, let's say, literally, (laughs) yes, in the sexual underworld Mm -hmm. of prostitution and swinging Mm -hmm. and sex clubs and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes. To write about sex. And what decade was that? The 90s? 1980 is when it was published, but he had spent about a decade on it in the 70s. Um, So I, I read the book. I was very, very impressed with the immersive aspect, as we were saying, the the literally immersive aspect. And uh, but but I felt it was told from an exceedingly male perspective. I went to go meet with him. He told me that the only way that I could I will I would never surpass his book, but the only way I could somehow match it or come close to doing so was by going out and sleeping with married men. Seriously? Mm -hmm, Yes. Well, thank you, Gay Talese. So, yeah, well, you know, I, I mean... That's pretty uh, annoying, and I appreciate your telling <laughs> us. And honestly, there's something really irritating about hearing that in this moment, which, of course, eight years ago wasn't this yes. moment. Yes, And eight years ago wasn't Me Too. Yes. But eight years ago, it was all, all the abuses and um, taking advantage of younger, less powerful females was happening. Yes. God, was it ever. Yes, exactly. It was, I know. Well, what was interesting about that advice was that I had seen, have you seen Mallrats? No. A 90s movie, so we're moving up a decade, but um, one of, it, it was a movie about Literally, kid like kids in the '90s who right. were going to the mall and their life experience is basically Breakfast Club, but a lot less meaningful. But more shopping. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's it, it definitely captured part of part of the era, and I think it's a great movie. Um, but there was a young woman in it who would have sex with men, and sort of while she was having sex with them, she would be writing about the experience. Um, to sort of catalog it. And so from that, the idea that it was married men was obviously not something I was going to get into. And I wasn't going to get into any of that. But I was like, oh, well, she did that in Mallrats. So maybe he's coming from a place of, in any case, I remember going home to my uh, my Esquire editor that night and saying, Gay Talese told me to do this. Does it make me not a good journalist if this is something that I'm not even going to think about doing? And he said, no, I don't I don't think so. <laughs> so that was, but so he, I, I was he should have said, go speak to Mrs. Talese. See how she right. feels about yes. it. Yeah. Yes. Um, Yes. But so, were you married at the time no. that you used? Okay, so you were single, mm-hmm. and you eventually discerned that you were going to write about women, married or single, who were in the clutches for whom desire was the most powerful and mm-hmm. important factor. Yes. 
Yes. What what I was I was looking for. Uh, I didn't really scrap the idea of men so much as women began to sort of just open up to me more in a kind of a way that felt very one raw and two completely sort of stripped bare of any ego. Whereas there with the men with the men I spoke to anyway there was ego involved for much of them. Uh, so with the women, what was what I was looking for, period, was one, people in the throes of, like you said, of, of this passion. Two, I kind of wanted something unfolding in the moment um, or, or something that had just unfolded. So not something because a lot of people would be like, oh, 40 years ago, I had this great affair. And while that was intriguing, I wanted something more immediate. And the third thing that was the hardest thing to find was somebody who was going to talk to me and tell me all these things and let me live in their community and talk to their friends. And at one point, I said I was going to use real names again, because Gay Talese told me I'd be a hack if I didn't. But this was the internet. Age. I mean, there's a lot going on. So so that was hard and um and that so I was looking for someone who's willing somebody who is passionate and somebody whose story was sort of unfolding in the moment but the stories you were told were so intimate the details are so graphic and intimate it's almost as if you were in the bedrooms with them or in the back of a suburban as the case may be well with lena i nearly was um not quite in the back of the suburban but almost every time that she met aiden who was the man that she started up a relationship again she had he had been her high school lover she was now stuck in this marriage where her husband said he didn't want to kiss her on the mouth anymore so she was in this very um very sad sad state and she struck up this relationship with aiden uh, he w- had been everything to her in high school. She had never stopped thinking about her. Now he is back in her life again. So uh, when this was happening in real time when I met her, so that was uh, it was just kind of amazing. Um, she would go meet him at this place called The River where they had met in high school, and they would have sex. And after they had sex, she, would, she didn't use text because it was too expensive. So she had Facebook messaging. So she would Facebook message me. Um, I had a feeling you yeah. were the friend that yes. she was yes. Facebook messaging. Yes, I wanted to keep myself out yes. of it. No, that yes. was smart. But like the high school girl she mm-hmm. had been, yes. she's got to talk about it. She would be judged because she was religious. Mm-hmm. She was still technically married mm-hmm. and and her friends would disapprove. So she would write to you and say, he told me he loved me, Mm -hmm. or at least a body part. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And that was you. So you were right there. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. The immediacy is very palpable as a reader. I mean, I felt like even I was there in the back of that (laughs) suburban. So to find three women who were that willing to open up to you and to be so honest and without ego... How many women did you find and how did you put the alert out that you wanted to talk and that you were going to be respectful and they could trust you Mm -hmm. because they're telling you their most personal and intimate stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, I spoke to hundreds of people, women, women more so, but hundreds. I don't know how many, but a lot of hundreds. How did you get to North Dakota or Indiana and just... So the first thing, so I I drove across the country six times. Um, I would post signs up that said, you know, looking for uh, passionate stories of, you know, sex. Do you want to talk about sex, et cetera? The signs said a million different things. I would post them up in various places above changing room tables in Texas, um, cars to go windows. I was just like, you know, it'll be some passing person, slot machines in New Orleans, literally just truck stops, everything. I was trying the Four Seasons in Atlanta and like the cheapest motels. The only states I didn't think I went to is Wisconsin for some bizarre reason because I've always wanted to go. Hawaii and Alaska. And other than that, I pretty much canvassed the country. So, yeah, so I did that. And then the first thing that I did that became a part of my book was finding Lena. And in order to find Lena, I had moved to Indiana, kind of just 
by the seat of my pants. The so center um, of the country, yes, more or I, less. And yeah. Kinsey Institute was right. there. Kinsey is in Bloomington. Yes. So I met this doctor on one of my trips uh, across the country, and he was conducting these hormone treatments for these women. And it wasn't something like, you know, something um, like a real, it was just kind of, Hey, do you want to try this? Do you want to try this? And 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 they were held, they were losing weight. They were feeling newly more sexual. Their bodies were just getting into sort of chemical order more than they had been. And so uh, he told me that these women, what some of them might want to talk to me. So I had that, and I had Kinsey, and I had the middle of the country. And I thought, I'm in New York City. I'm too much in my own world. I'm too much unpacking text messages with friends. You know, I'm not writing my book. So I moved to Indiana. I didn't really tell anyone because I just was afraid of people trying to stop me and them saying, are you crazy? So um, so I moved there and I started a discussion group and that's how I met Lena. Ah, you started a discussion yeah. group. Yes. Wink, wink. She mentions a discussion yes. group. Now, wait a second. Lisa. <laughs> Yes. That was brilliant. That yeah. was brilliant. I, I mean, there was a lot of there were a lot of non brilliant things. So. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So you start a discussion group, and eventually, Lena, who has this very interesting and, in my opinion, heartbreaking mm-hmm. story, uh, becomes one of your confidants. Mm-hmm. Is she one of the people whose names you disguised? Yes. So the only name that is is real is Maggie's. Who, who had the relationship, the alleged relationship with, with the, the teacher. teacher. So, okay, so Lena tells you everything. You become part, in a way, of her romance mm-hmm. with Aiden. And just to fill in our listeners who haven't read the book, her husband is cold and inattentive, won't kiss her, turns his back to her. She decides if she hasn't had sex in three months. Mm-hmm. She's going to separate. Well, if he doesn't even touch her in three months. And she it, literally just wants her to shoulder be, grazed. And that part mm-hmm. was as painful as anything mm-hmm. to read in the book. Mm-hmm. And guess what? She separates from mm-hmm. him and rekindles in a very uh, yearning and sad way an affair with her high school crush and, mm-hmm. and boyfriend. And when you left her... Was her stop-and-go relationship with Aiden still happening? Yes. Um, Yes, it was. It was nearing its end. Uh, I'm still in touch with her as I am with all three of them. Um, And so she's in a much better place now. She's with a new man. They're both separated. There's no... Um, you know, there's no kind of hiding anymore. So she's doing much better. But when I left her, yes, it was still going on. And then shortly after I started finishing the book, it it had... And, and I, you know, it's funny because I said to my editor, I was like, you know, I could just keep reporting on Lena forever because she was the one who just, I mean... She needed a friend needed, to talk yeah, to. Exactly. And, and you was, were that friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is she happy with the way the book turned out? So she t- she has read a little bit, does not want to see the whole thing because she is afraid of feeling. She She's afraid of what she felt then, and she doesn't want to see herself then and is afraid, I think, that things will come up again. Um the, uh, the I gave I sent the book to you know, all of them. The other two read it b- much before it was finished, so that they could have um, make changes and subtractions. And interestingly, they both made additions, which was really, really, really striking and awesome. I think. And so, well, they trusted yeah. you, which is also yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, the. Um, the story of Maggie, she's the youngest of the three. She had had, allegedly, but I'm going to say I believe her, so she had an affair with her high school English teacher, mm-hmm. which was, in my view, uh, instigated by him, mm-hmm. but misinterpreting her. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was very attracted to him. Um, I also don't think it was the first time he was involved with a student, what do you think? So I... And maybe you know something. I, there were some things that I heard that I was not able to add. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because on the one hand, there are some aspects of it that felt to me there's sometimes that people, you know, the the casual, the usual trope of a woman saying, but he's leaving his wife for me, but it's really me and he wouldn't do this to me. I've seen a lot of that where it is true or that I think it's true or that at least it, it's been true in the time since I've watched it in a friend or an acquaintance. Um, yeah, so I, in that way, I felt a lot of that in that situation. Her feelings for him were love. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was obsessed with him, but she also, I think, was deeply in love. Yes. I mean, I think the number one thing was, yes, but I also think that she was in love with this person that he made her feel Feel like. Mm -hmm. And the same way that I think he was allegedly in love with the person she made him feel like. And that's a lot of what early love is. You know, I was saying to my husband the other day, um, you know, I don't think people fall in love when they know, if they if we totally knew each other, <laughs> would we have fallen in love? Right. Because sometimes he looks at me and he's like, who are you? <laughs> but in a different way, you know, right. like, why are you here? You know, why is, how did we have this kid? No, I mean, it's all fine. <laughs> right, right. You know, there's that feeling of, um, so, so I think that that early love is like, I love who I am. Am with, with you, you or who yeah. I was before I became a husband and a father and somebody with a mortgage and panic attacks or whatever. Well, speaking of which, uh, you do go into some real depth on every woman's father. Mm-hmm. And I think the fathers are vitally important in this story. But let's extrapolate mm-hmm. about American women. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, are we, in your view, looking for our father Mm -hmm. or is every choice we make in relation to our fathers well and I guess we're just talking about heterosexual cisgendered women I guess for the most part although I you know I don't I spoke to hundreds of people many of them a lot of them not cisgendered white women so it's it's you know and i know the three that i chose the two are cisgendered and one is is bisexual but really more so you know at this level in the game more so she's married to a man that said i wouldn't still call her cisgendered because her her tastes are very like she can do whatever she feels and wants and it's different um, year to year. She always loves her husband, but that doesn't mean, I think, because he's a man. So while I don't think she calls herself bisexual, really, I, I do think it's a little bit pansexual. Um, anyway, all of that said, regarding the father's question, I I think it's more mothers, to be honest. I, I talk about fathers. I also talk about mothers because for me, and I think we talk about daddy issues all the time, I have severe mommy issues, and I don't think that's a part of the lexicon as much, uh, but I do think it's it's a lot of it. And I think that in general, um, yes, they were looking for their fathers, but they were also what we do, and I'm not an expert, but obviously in, in anything scientific, but but what, what I notice is that we look for in our partners that which we either were missing in childhood or trying to replicate from childhood. And so, so Sloan, for example, who had a rather cold upbringing, found this man who thinks thinks who says she's his fantasy who truly feels that she no matter even if they're sleeping with other people he's still got his uh, she's the main thing um no matter how many years of marriage no matter how many kids no matter what she looks like on any given day he's obsessed with her and so she was i think looking for someone who would just love her like that um the same way lena was looking for a passion that she didn't have and and a father a fa- in Lena's case very much so a father who she wanted to see more but her mother wouldn't let her go right. fishing with him um, and then Maggie who I think was looking to recreate what her parents had which was very powerful and also to fill this this hole of what she thought she wasn't worth when in fact she was worth very much it is worth very much 
But because of a variety of situations, I think a lot of them socioeconomic, and a lot of them just here is this man who is a pillar of the community. He ends up being awarded North Dakota's Teacher of the Year. So um, yeah, I think so. I think we're looking for yes, our fathers or mothers or the antithesis of our fathers and mothers. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess that's I don't know if that's Freudian. I did read a lot of Freud for the book, but I, you know, I'm not like I said an expert. I'm just an observer. The We have to extrapolate from these three women. You've gotten a little flack for the women all being white. Mm -hmm. I I think you have to go with the people who are talking to you. You Mm -hmm. can't make this a book that is a perfect mosaic of America because not everybody is going to talk to you. And when you walk into a discussion room or a church basement or whatever, you present as a white woman and mm-hmm. that's going to be good or bad. Exactly. And that's and yes. too bad for people who complain. <laughs> I have to say since there was so little talk about gender, yeah. I found it both kind of freeing because I feel like I've been trying to heed all the political correct rules mm-hmm. of gender these days and this was kind of a break from it a little bit. But it didn't offend me that there wasn't a trans person Mm -hmm. in the book. And and again, anybody who's bickering about your selection, I think, doesn't understand the process of getting three fully total strangers Mm -hmm. to confide in you as a reporter, as an outsider. Yeah. So I wanted to say that. But I want to also ask you, these women would do anything for passion. Maggie was obsessed and stuck and in love with the teacher, but also furious with him. Mm -hmm. You know, she wanted to hurt him for breaking it off with Mm -hmm. her. But she, six years later, was still enthralled to him. Lena is desperate to be kissed. She just loves being kissed Mm -hmm. by her high school boyfriend after being married and having a big house and two nice kids and so on. Sloan just wants to feel, she says she's a submissive, but in so many ways I I consider her the (laughs) dominant. I know, I know. And so she she needs the affirmation of two different people at any one time to feel whole, she says. Or in this case, the chef and her husband to feel whole. And I'm wondering if you think that all women, this is tough, are really more motivated by love and passion than by money, family, career, education, upward mobility, and so on. I think that, you know, I after talking to so many people, I, I was looking for people who wanted to talk about desire. So I wasn't looking for people who wanted to talk about making all this money or becoming president. Um, so, but that said, I was also looking for a variety of people, not for, you know, I, I, by the time I had found Sloan, I had several, I was looking for a woman who was more so in a position of power. And Sloan was that, is Mm -hmm. that. She isn't, like, as you said, she called herself a submissive and in a lot of ways, just as, I mean, that's the thing that I think is so strange is that we are all the sort of protagonists or the antagonists of our own lives at any given moment. So I wanted to show the breadth of that. And with Sloan, she was on top and then she was on the bottom. And Lena, the same thing. She was experiencing these moments of utter passion and then she would feel these utter lows. But with that great passion, sometimes come that great low. And I don't know anyone who's ex- who hasn't experienced both. So I think that one of my issues that I've had, and I, you know, I don't mind people saying that it should have been more um, broad in terms of gender and and race. I mean, I had people. I had 25 people at the first draft separated from the hundreds that I had spoke, spoken to. There was a gay man. There was a black woman. There, there were multiple different races and genders. And 
As a matter of fact, I moved to Newport, Rhode Island for a gay man who was a life coach at the age of 19. So there were multiple people. That's so I don't but I don't mind people saying something about that because you can't really tell unless you talk to me or unless you see my first draft what I had. But what I do think, what I do take issue with is when people do call the women victims because I don't find them to be victims. And I think we are all victims to that extent. We are all. And one of the reasons that I wanted, that pushed me to be so detailed in the book, that pushed me to live for as long as I did with Lena, with Sloan, with Maggie. I didn't live in North Dakota, but I was there a lot. And we talked, we texted hourly for months, um, like hourly. And so my friend went back in New York. I had told her, she was like, what are you doing in Indiana? I said, you know, I'm, I'm following this woman around. We're going to the gym. We're, we're, I'm hanging out with her at the house with her kids. And she's like, why? And I said, well, first, I, I like her. You know, <laughs> it's, I like her. She's a good person, a cool person. But also, she's telling me all these things. And she's telling me how she's going to meet this man four hours away at the drop of a hat. And she's getting a babysitter for her kids and, and trying to get gas in this car and not put too many miles on that car. And my friend said, God, that's so pathetic. Oh, and that, I don't think that's pathetic at all. Well, what was even more galling to me was that, and I had to remind her, I'm like, you did the same thing X amount of months ago with Mr. X, who just because he was in a different job in a different city did not make it seem pathetic. Perhaps you didn't have kids, so you didn't get right. babysitters, but to sort of, um, and it's what Lena said. She's like, we shouldn't judge each other if we haven't lived through each other's fires and, and in each other's shoes. And that's how I felt. So I wanted to get granular so that everybody, every gender, every every race, every type of person could see a bit of themselves in one, two, or all three of them the way that I did. I I don't think they're victims. I mm-hmm. think Maggie is a victim of some yes. very... I yes, mean, yes, yes, yes. And, and it's really unfair to talk about this book as if everybody has read it, because not everybody has read it. I, I hope more and more will, and and uh, it's a wonderful read. But But these are women who are in many ways in control of their narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, the last particular thing I want to ask you about your book, Three Women, is about the writing style. In my imagination, thinking, okay, she's got hours and hours of tapes of all these Mm -hmm. women. She is writing it as they speak. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yes. Um, I, wa- I Literally, the, what I would do with each of them is, well, with Maggie, it was mainly having text messages from her, like, you know, and I also had all the trial documents, so I was also able to, that was the easiest in a sense, because I had a skeleton, it was all said, it was all written down, mm-hmm. so I could just kind of go, and what about this moment, and then we would talk for hours about one moment. With Lena, there were tons of but what I would do mostly is I would sit across from them the way I'm sitting across from you and I would just have my phone out and I would type notes to myself Um, so I would have tape often but also when you're driving around in a car I'm not bringing a tape around and doing this so I mainly would just sit there while they drove or while they talked or while we ate lunch or while we went to feminist lectures etc and just sat there and, and wrote emails to myself which is I don't know how to use the notes app so I just write emails like I have thousands of emails a month where I'm just like oh my god I gotta go through these and transcribe them Um, but so that's what I did so and it often looked I think it not looked they knew what I was doing but it often looked like I was just otherwise absorbed in my phone Oh, so I think it felt I mean I was they knew I was writing what they were saying but it's different than typing on a typewriter while someone's talking it's different than Um, They didn't feel like they they were being deposed. Yes, they just felt like we were having a conversation and I was on my phone and we were talking. And it just wasn't like a sound. There was no sound to it. There was no, including a tape. With a tape, there's a lot of, oh, God, I'm going to be on tape. With this, it was, these are my words and they're going to be down there. But they're also, I have a freedom here to not not sort of be in an echo chamber kind of a thing. Um, So... So that's that's predominantly I had there were when it came to Lena, 
who was, like I said, the most willing to um, to just give me everything, or the most, not willing, but the most desirous of Hungry, giving me everything. Maybe. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Needing. Um, and so after she would send me these messages, or after she would call me when she had been with Aiden, I would I was usually waiting in this like little winery down the road, and I was, um, you know, drinking cider beers and taking notes and transcribing. And after she left Aiden, she would come and talk to me, and sometimes we would go back together or I would go back myself to the river where they had been so I could sort of take in the same sights and smells and sounds. And and that way, not only was she telling them to me, but I was also hearing them myself and able to um, kind of, uh, you know, merge the two. Do you think most women have big secrets like those women yeah. do? I mean, it's funny. It's like a lot of people have said things like, oh, you know, I mean, uh, that hasn't, I don't know, a camp. And uh, it's like if you talk to someone for more than a month or even a week, uh, you know, and, and you and they trust you and you're not judgmental and you're not part of their community yet or not in a way in which they'll feel threatened that you're going to go and tell. Like, I, I think there's a difference between telling the world in a book and telling someone you know, that lives next door, like, oh, can you believe what Janet did? It's different to say Janet did this because Janet felt this, as opposed to, oh, my God, can, with the second there's judgment, that's when the person feels violated. Right, right. It's an extraordinary experience reading your book, honestly. And I I think uh, congratulations Thank on you. a job really well done. I just want to say I read that you were a fan of Robert Coover. Yes, massive. As, as am I. Oh, cool. And there's that short story he wrote about... Going for a beer? Oh, the no. one about the girl... <laughs> Babysitter. In the yes. apartment? Yes, yes. Oh. That's amazing. He's, he's the best. Did I you mean, get to study with him? No, not at all. I wrote something about him for Granta. I saw that, yeah. Um, no, I haven't. I've just I've read his books. I've been obsessed for years. I think he's absolutely fantastic. I would love to meet him one day. So if he's listening to your show. Yes, Robert <laughs> Coover. If you're here. Call us both. Call us both. <laughs> or we'll visit you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Lisa Tadeo, what what's next for you? And then we're going to get to your five things. So I um, am adapting the sh- the sh- the book for Showtime. Mm. Um, and I am my novel is coming out next year and followed my by my collection of short stories so uh, there's been a lot going on it's funny because for oh, like I feel like an underachiever I'm no, sorry no, no, I asked no it's funny because I didn't really do any I, I I mean I did obviously I worked on the book but I had just done the book it was I thought about it every day even if I didn't work on it for one day I thought about it but I, I was also it was more spread out it wasn't and then my daughter was born and I was like, I have to just, I have to produce and produce and produce because I don't know. I just felt like, I don't know, I had this nihilist mentality of some, something happens to me. I need her to like have all these things. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what's in my Capricorn brain. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, you'll be busy for a while. <laughs> no, I'm so exhausted. <laughs> well, maybe you'll come back and talk to me about your next project, I, I your to. novel. I would love to. But in the meantime, you were nice enough to produce a list of five things that mean a lot to you mm-hmm. and have made your life better. <laughs> and <laughs> let's talk about thing number one. Mm-hmm. So there are these little rubber animals. I don't know where I first saw them, but I, when I first saw them, I thought these are amazing. And now I see them everywhere. So it's no longer this special thing, but they still are. And like every time I find them, I buy a bunch. So they're like 25 cents each. I've mainly gotten them for my daughter. I think the first thing I got her was a unicorn. And she uh, she she loves them for a day. Yeah. Um and then then and she'll she forget about them. them. No, she's past eating, thank goodness. But um but yeah, she'll like wash them in the bath. I try to like get 3 minutes to myself so I'm like wash this guy, but they're so small so it takes her a second. Um so she gets done with them and then I just found cuz I have such high anxiety, I take them and I just put them in little like formations around my desk because they make me feel happy and then I also put them like on the kitchen shelves and my husband's like why is this rhinoceros next to the salt and I'm like because it makes me happy (laughs) what's it to you exactly (laughs) and are these the kinds of 
Animals that come in vending machines? No, they're smaller than that. They're like re- they're like this big, and they're rubber, and they're twenty five cents each, wow. and they're teeny tiny like that. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, good. Like, okay, they sound <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'll get you one. <laughs> okay. You don't keep them in your pockets no, or anything. No, you know I don't. Wait, I'm trying to think because I do have my. But no, I don't have one on me. <laughs> okay, number two. So number two is a space heater that I have under my desk. I literally use it every day, except for maybe on 85 degree days. But on those days, if the air conditioning is on, I'll still use it because my husband wants to be cool. And I don't want to be sweating, but I want my feet to be warm. And I don't know if I have poor circulation or what. I just like it. It makes me feel like I'm in a Charles Dickens novel. <laughs> <laughs> in a sweatshop yeah. somewhere in in southern England. You are just like Tiny Tim slicing a pea in half and Aww. being warming oneself by the fire. I mean, you know, Aww. I'm being a little bit hyper-romantic, but um, in a sad, you know, poverty-stricken way that is unfair to, to romanticize. But that's what I feel when I'm with it. it, it. No judgment. <laughs> okay. No judgment. <laughs> I like you. a space heater, too. <laughs> Maybe not today, but number three. Um, so our dog, whose name is Rue, who is a chocolate lab. So she is a wonderful dog. She is very wild when a person, a new person comes over. But when there isn't, she's the quietest dog in the world. She just hangs out. You, I've stepped on her. Not stepped, but I've almost, because she's like a rug. She just lays there. doesn't <laughs> care if you walk by. Um, and at night when I'm snacking, because that's what I do when I'm writing, it's like I always gain at least 10 pounds when I'm actively working on something because what, it, you know, the anxiety needs to be fed somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am just snacking down there. She's always by my feet. And I'm like, I know that she's there a lot because I'm eating. So I always like feed her some stuff. And then, but I just, it just is. So our daughter was born and, you know, the dog was our first kid. But then, you know, as all things happen, the kid kid comes in and the dog, um, you know, I read this, I read The Lady and the Tramp to my daughter a lot. And uh, the, what Tramp or no, no, one of the other dogs says to Lady, you know, when the baby comes in, the dog moves out. And it's like the saddest thing. And that's kind of, and my daughter's like, yeah, bye, Rue. <laughs> <laughs> but then she also, I'm like, you know, that's the only sister you're ever going to have. So you better be nice to her. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so, so the dog is like this, has just become this, this person that just at night mainly is just the only two company yes yes, what's my space here don't you feel that dogs are are security blankets no matter what a hundred percent they're just you know especially ones that you don't really have to i mean i've there's been some wild dogs in my life that you kind of have to so this dog is just she's always been so easy to just just be with excellent Number four. <laughs> this is very funny. So, yeah, I don't know. The first time I found them, I, I was in school. I was getting my MFA at BU. My daughter was an infant. I was exhausted. I would be up all night with her or writing um, short stories for the program and this book, et cetera, doing everything concurrently. I was exhausted. And I would be up literally at 4 o'clock in the morning, and then I would go to sleep for two hours and get up at 6. And I would, like I said before, with um, the family dog number three, I was snacking. And I bought these for a babysitter we had who was vegan. And I just tried one one night, and they are. I'm not vegan. Right and wait, they're called chicken sliders. Yeah, chickens is C H I K apostrophe N because it's As not a, real chicken. Right, and, and 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 what are they made out of? They're I, soy? some kind of soy protein, but they don't taste. They taste like chicken. They taste better than chicken. Whatever chicken is, they taste better than chicken. And I like. And you kind of have to. If you do it the way they tell you, it doesn't come out as well. You can just microwave it. I I take the buns and toast them and then I take the patty and I fry it in a pan so I make it as difficult as possible to eat this microwave thing and then I put honey and mayonnaise oh, inside wow. the bun and it's, yeah I have a whole thing wait they come <laughs> with the bun yeah it's a microwavable thing it's like in, it's like a white castle slider that you would buy frozen they're uh-huh. frozen and then you just pop it in the microwave but I it's like a 20 minute process so you don't eat as many as you could if oh, you no, just I, nick them oh no I do because you can put like a couple of bags in the pan <laughs> at once. so no I 
we have a four slice toaster, so no, there's two, there could be two going on. Wow, they're really <laughs> that good, huh? They're so you, everyone should try one. I'm gonna try. I hope I hope they the gar. I think it's guard garden G A R D E I N. G-A-R-D-E-I-N. I hope they hear and just send me a lifetime supply. So okay, that, garden. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That would be good. Okay, I'm I'm definitely going to order some or buy some um, when I go to the supermarket. Can you get them anywhere? Uh, um, I haven't seen them everywhere. Definitely, you know, organic markets, Whole Foods, etc. I but I've seen them. I think they're really making a big impact. They're great. Uh, they're not for just vegans. Okay, I'm really putting a star. No, it's it's real. And please let me know what you think. I will. I, I don't want to give people the wrong suggestions, but I really want to know feedback. Almost nothing to me is better than chicken. So, uh, so those me, are okay. That's a challenge to me. Okay. Okay. And but you have to do it the way that I. I will. You have to but honey them. and and yes and mayonnaise. What about you mustard could, or ketchup or? You can try whatever you want. My my time tested by <laughs> a lot <laughs> is a little drop of honey and a little bit of mayonnaise. They don't need much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I promise you. <laughs> okay. I promise you. Um, Okay, and Lisa, number five. So, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't really know we were going to read these. We were going to talk about these. You don't have to. No, it's fine. I don't mind. I just, no, 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 it's fine. I just was thinking that it was going to, anyway. So when um, my parents both passed away and my one of my best friends, Jan, who um, is just a wonderful person and I would never have even thought about something like this. She took... Um, she asked me if for a couple of their clothes, clothing items, and she said, "Do you mind if these don't come back in their pro- in the shapes in which they are?" And I said, "No." Um, I had a lot of things that I were, was keeping, so I gave her stuff that was important, but not you know that I needed whole. And um, she, a couple of months later, I think it took a long time, she gave me this quilt that had been. Um, was uh, sewed together all of these items, this giant quilt of like my parents. So I, yeah, that's something I have. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was really kind. It's incredible. Super, super kind person. And so you have your parents, you can hug them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You you write about losing your mom in the middle uh-huh. of this book. I'm very moved by that whole, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa, you're really interesting to talk to. I'm glad you're finding success. Thank you. And you didn't need to sleep with married men. <laughs> I know, I didn't. I No, I fact, believe I, you. I, I... <laughs> no. Come on, gay Talise, wake up. <laughs> Well, you've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Lisa Tadeo, author of Three Women, published this past July by Avid Reader Press, Simon & Schuster. You can follow Lisa on Twitter and Instagram at Lisa Tadeo or on her website at lisatadeo.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, YouTube, and iHeartRadio or anywhere else. I don't care where else. Read it on the bus or download it from the fumes. My blog is at lisabernbach.com and you'll find links and photos that refer to stuff we discussed today. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Jimmy Regan. My team is Espresso Rucci, Michael Port, Sam Haft, and Boko Haft. Until next week, stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.